Hello there, sword friends. Let's talk about the Ryujin 1095 katana that they sent me for the purposes of drunken testing slash reviewing, though the drunken was optional or implied, I don't know. As I often do, I'll start with the butt, the kashra. I'm a butt man, what can I say? It's where I begin, it's where I end. Too much and information. Got oddly specific really quickly. Let's move on, the kashra. First off, casting quality is adequate. I would call it on par or maybe slightly above average in terms of its overall look and quality. The awkwardness, though, is that the Kashra is assembled with this goofy little tooth that holds it on. It doesn't have the standard type of assembly of a Kashra, and that gives me some concerns about how well it'll hold up over time. Let's look at the grip. First off, note that the Ito. The diamonds are misshapen, oddward, and it looks like it was done a little sloppily. Little cockeyed, not exactly sure. In any case, somebody from Ryujin did reach out to me and said that this isn't a common thing that they have. Other swords in their inventory don't seem to have this lazy-eyed approach to Ito wrapping. The Ito is also loose in some spots, tight in others. However, after all the destructive testing, the Ito held up pretty well. The Samegawa panels are also a little ugly. Not only can I make out the edge of the Samegawa panels, but it was bunched up towards the end when I got the sword, and I find that kind of ugly. Typically, I like a bunchy butt, but Too in this case, not so much. The Fuchi. Well, it matches the Kashra, as you would expect. There are some transitions here. It's less comfortable in the hand, but it didn't really bother me while I was swinging the bitch around. Let's talk about the Suba. The first thing I'm going to note is I really like it. Now you might ask why the casting quality doesn't necessarily look better than some of the other manufacturers out there like Hanway. And really I think it's the patina, the coloring on this Suba that does it for me. It doesn't look like shitty, crappy, haphazardly painted black Suba. Also, the gold etching or plating doesn't look like it was applied with finger paints. Now, it misses the mark. It's not a, an antique Shakudo Suba. It's not hitting it out of the park as it comes to emulating what it's trying to do, but at least it gets closer than some of the other people do. In any case, I like it. If you don't, fuck you. Or not fuck you. It's a subjective thing. Let's move on to the Habaki. Look, there it is. Let's move on to the Saya. The Saya is this wine red with mother of pearl inlay, and frankly, I think it's a kind of interesting Saya. It's, it's one of those things that you're either going to like or not like. Some of the mother of pearl is a little misshapen and not on there, but again, this sword is not particularly expensive. At $500, this is not a bad thing to see for a $500 sword. I can make out the wood grain underneath the mother of pearl. It has a nice, rich, deep red stain, and I don't make out any flaws in the wood that were applied or fixed with wood putty that have muddled the appearance or overall presentation of the Saya. Also, it does what Saya's do, and it held the sword without making a whole bunch of noise. It also held the Habaki, and did a good job in terms of Noto moving it around, and it was fun to use. Also, some of the sounds that initially came with it that seemed a little scratchy, well, they went down a little over time after using it for a couple weeks. The one thing that I found maybe a little odd about the Saya was that it came with some pookie. Right on the tippy top of the Koiguchi, the mouth of the Saya had this resin or lacquer residue that didn't go off no matter how hard I banged the Suba into it. It certainly wasn't a performance enhancing drug, but it certainly didn't impede it either. It was just unsightly and looked like somebody was messy. The Sageo is also worth noting that it seems like extra Ito that was applied to the blade rather than a purpose-built Sageo. It's not very thick and it feels a little chintzy, but... It does the job, and many, many people end up buying a new Sageo that they like more rather than using the one that comes with the manufacturer, or it just stays in the presentation, not forever. So in any case, it doesn't really bother me. Now let's talk about Pointy McStabbertons. The blade is supposed to be made out of 1095, or at least that's what was listed on their website. I can't really tell you if it is or is not 1095. In any case, what I can say is that the planes are pretty even. The shaping is not terrible, even though it looks like it was polished a little bit with a buffer. The polish is subtle, and I think with a little extra etching, the hamon could be brought out quite a bit more. In the right light, it really shows, and there's some activity and fun stuff to look at. However, in the wrong light, it doesn't really look like anything. Then again, for the price point of this sword, I'm not expecting an artful polish or somebody to have spent many, many hours laboriously sanding this thing on a rock. In general, it looked good. It didn't come all scratched up and fucked, and frankly, for the price point, I think it's pretty on par or reasonable for what you're getting. Some of the other bits to note is that this sword came with a pretty box. It also came with a certificate of authenticity. First off, the box, to me, is, is not something overly special. It's, it's pretty, and if you a need box. a box, and you want to put it on a place where you can show the box, then it comes with a, it comes with a box. 
Yeah, look at that box. I'm not a box tester though, so moving on. The certificate of authenticity had some issues that I would like to note, namely that the weights and measurements are slightly off, within a tolerable variation, but still, if you're going to provide measurements that give this impression that this sword is actually this length, they should be really, really accurate. To what degree, I suppose, is... I don't know if it's objective, but, you know, kind of. The thing that's not is just wrong information. The blade length isn't correct unless you're measuring with a habaki, and that's not how things generally work to my understanding, though I guess I could be wrong. However, the fittings, the fujikasha, are not brass because they're magnetic, and, and that brass isn't magnetic, so that... Basically, when there's misinformation on here, it leads you to question all the other things that you can't necessarily verify. The blade length being off, but also maybe having habaki. The thickness being off hundreds or thousands of an inch. And the weight being off about an ounce. Makes me think nobody actually measured this, it's just kind of a predetermined whatever. To that degree, I do really like certificates of authenticity, particularly when they contain all of this type of information and look this pretty. It makes a nice frame and whatever. However, I think they really need to be accurate and that would be my bitch and moan. In terms of using it, it went well. I swung it around, it swung good. It got more comfortable over time, and frankly, I will admit I feel sorry about killing the sword, because me and the sword bonded. It bears a similarity to one of my favorite swords, the Hanwei Bamboo Mat that I had customized, and the weight distribution in me started to really jive with one another. Unfortunately, I had to put her down. That gets us on to the actual whacking stuff. In terms of tatami cutting, it's really not sharp enough for me to do the job effectively. What I found is that if I tried to let the sword do the work, it didn't have the edge necessary to let my sword do that thing. Basically, if I have to swing really hard, and if I swing really hard, I can't swing really accurately, and I have to muscle through. The trick isn't necessarily cutting tatami, that's not the challenge, it's cutting it well and accurately with form, grace, keeping your point, stopping at the end. There's more to it than getting through the mat. However, I had to forego many of those other things to get through the mat, which to me says it's not sharp enough. Now, it could be, but even at a $500 sword, even at a kind of mid-range thing, I don't think you should have to sharpen a sword out of the box to get it to do what you want. For tatami cutting, I can't say I would recommend it. However, for other fun backyard shit, it actually worked out pretty well. Pool noodles at times would laugh at me, but other times I seemed to have more success. Water bottles were fun, it cut beer cans, and frankly it wasn't until I started cutting cans of shaving cream that it showed any edge deformation. Also, along many bad tatami cuts, along many, many oh, bad other cuts, yeah. along cutting brush, and a myriad of other things, the blade didn't show really any edge deformation. There was no rolling except for when I cut a big steel can that was pressurized. That included beer cans and all sorts of other stuff. Also, it didn't start bending until I really whacked it into a log the wrong way, which is incredibly abusive to a sword. And even then, the bend wasn't substantial. After actually taking the sword, jamming the tip into a log and bending it intentionally, the bend was not as pronounced as what you might expect from other swords. So while I can't recommend the edge for tatami cutting, I can say that the sword is relatively resilient for its price point and, and did a relatively good job in terms of being shock resistant to bad cuts and begin. The handle also held up to the testing. Well, not the kashra, that fell off and that's not surprising. However, the handle didn't crack. Now towards the end of the life of the sword, what I did is I took an extra sword and did some sword on sword contact and it honestly didn't take a whole lot to beat this sword apart. Though that's not surprising because it's supposed to be 1095, a more brittle steel. And on repeated impact, it's more likely to crack. The surprising thing was that this sword did not crack the same way other 1095 swords have. It was much more durable, resilient. And that makes me question if it is 1095 or T10, because that certificate again says T10 and 1095, and I frankly don't know if I thought they were different things. So that's like saying it's red and blue. So purple? I don't, I don't understand. However, from the performance aspect, it did seem to exceed the shock resistance of most 1095 blades that I've tested, both in terms of not having clumps fall out of the edge when I do sword-on-sword -sword contact, as well as not taking a set or bend very easily. So, I think it might actually be more T10 than 1095, though I, I guess I'd, I'd, maybe they're the same thing. I'm not a metallurgist. In the end, I personally don't think the bitch is worth $500, and here's why. 
There are other products out there that are a little below, a little above, or maybe right on $500 from companies like Minatoshi or Skydro that have both made a sword that is effective at cutting tatami right out of the box with a keener edge than this sword has, as well as more attention to the finer details that make up these Japanese-style swords, like a more defined, sh better shaped ska, or tighter ito, or better transitions. However, I'm not going to argue that this sword is a bad sword. Mostly from the standpoint that it didn't edge roll in places I thought it would, and it didn't bend in places I thought it should. It didn't fail in the testing until I deliberately and intentionally tried to make it fail in a test I was confident would break the sword. To that end, most of the surprises I had with the sword were actually on the pleasant side. It cut well enough in some aspects, and it was incredibly durable. Additionally, this sword offers some customization services, and I was able to pick out the color and the theme that I wanted. Now that doesn't carry a lot of weight to me personally, but maybe it does to you and I do have to acknowledge that that is a feature that this sword has that the others that I mentioned did not. If you would rather have something customized to your specifications that's done a little more haphazardly, that rather than something that was predefined and done a little bit better in terms of execution, I can see why that would sway your opinion of value. In any respect, I hold true to the fact that if this sword is $500, that I don't think that it represents the best value on the market. And that's all I've got for you. Hopefully it's been helpful. As always, cheers.